Have you ever wondered what it's like to be an emergency doctor and what kind of skills are required to actually become one? Well, today I'll be speaking with Dr. John Lee, who is an emergency doctor. We discuss how he found being a medical student and junior doctor, why these days he chooses to work two overnight shifts a week, and his experience in fashion photography and music as well. Enjoy. Uh, hi, John. Thank you for joining me today and taking time out for this chat. That's all right. How you doing? Yeah, I'm doing pretty well. How about you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. All good. All good. Ready to roll. All right. Um, I was wondering if you could start off with just talking a bit about you know, what you do um, as your occupation and also what you enjoy and a bit about yourself. Okay. So uh, my name's John Lee. I'm a I'm 48 years old um, and I am a ED doctor. Uh, so emergency doctor. Um, I also lecture medical students and I am a, I guess you could call me semi-retired now, uh, fashion photographer and makeup artist and used to sort of be, do a fair bit in music and stuff as well many years ago. That's very good. It's very diverse. And yeah, that teaching yeah. aspect, mm -hmm. that teaching aspect is how I um, came to know you as well through both like the regular weekly teaching, but you also have those like disco series for students yep. as well. Yeah. I know in your sort of job title itself, um, it says you're a CMO. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, including me, weren't that familiar with that title. Would you be able to share a sure. bit about what that role is? Yeah, absolutely. So CMO stands for Career Medical Officer. Um, so what that means is that, so normally after you graduate from medicine, your first year, first of all, now two years out as an intern year, um, and then you're what we call a resident, so a junior doctor in the hospitals, um, and then you apply to join a specialty program, um, so, you know, like cardiology if you're looking after hearts or pediatrics looking after kids, um, and uh, you're a registrar during that training period. That's what they, they call you, a registrar, and then um, once you finish that specialty training, you become a consultant. Um, I looked at and we'll probably go into it a little bit more in a, in a bit but i looked at doing emergency training um didn't find the training part of it that appealing but um did enjoy emergency so basically a career medical officer is someone who has sort of you know uh does a mix of different things um and in particular for an emergency career medical officer it's someone who's you know spent many many years doing emergency we've got the experience and the knowledge uh just haven't done the official sort of training and um have the piece of paper behind us but um yeah we've got all the experience and know what we're doing so yeah and on that with you saying like how you progressed to becoming the emergency doctor you are now could you just go into sort of a bit of a broad overview of that so how you went from like high school you to emergency doctor you at the moment okay uh so yeah high school um yeah uh, so high school i think i finished i got into medicine uh 1993 i think um and then um from there i had an interesting journey i, I ended up repeating my first year um and then i also took a year off at the end of my fifth year and medicine was a six year course back then. Uh, so in total, I made it like an eight year course. Uh, so I graduated uh, 2000 um, and then uh, yeah, 2001 onwards uh, has been my medical journey. And I started with um, three full-time years um, working in all different specialties uh, all around Melbourne and um eventually decided that i wanted to uh do more emergency stuff and um but permanent part-time um and so i only did three full-time years and then i went permanent part-time thereafter so we'll dive a little bit into that first i'll mm -hmm. i'm a bit curious about the more specific aspects of each stage till sure. now um, and then afterwards we talk a bit about medicine i'll be very keen to hear about the other medical pursuits you have. So your involvement in teaching and I know Trek Medic and any other ventures that you've had as well. Um, and then finally a bit about the more exciting like fashion photography aspect as well. Okay. Great. Um, so with the whole becoming a doctor part, was there a certain moment or um, anything that led you into studying medicine <laughs> out of high school? No, not at all. Um, so I, there were some parts of my journey that are very similar to a lot of 
for Asian students in the sense that, um, you know, parents pushed me hard through, you know, school and high school uh, to achieve well and all that sort of stuff. Um, but atypically, uh, when it came time to choose what I wanted to do in university, uh, they actually backed right off and they said, it's really up to you. Um, and I remember not really knowing at all what I wanted to do. Um, you know, I was 17 um, and I had, yeah, really no idea of what, what I really wanted to do at all. And I think, and I made up my mind to do medicine literally 11.30 the night before change of preferences were due in. And I think I had medicine up first, arts law second, dentistry third, architecture fourth. Like it was so random. Like, And I would have been happy with anything. Like it was really... Um, yeah, didn't really have an idea at all of, of what, what being a doctor was all about. Um, and as a result, I think when I got into medicine, I didn't really enjoy it. Um, so studying medicine, uh, my med school in years, I didn't really enjoy medicine at all. But it was only after I graduated, became a doc. And then I had some really great senior docs who sort of took me under their wing and showed me what medicine is really all about. I was like, oh, I actually really love this. Um, and that was when it became real for me. But until that point, I, there were so many points in my med school journey where I asked myself, do I still want to do this? You know, and I, I seriously considered quitting many, many times. <laughs> yeah. I feel like your, your parents might have used some reverse psychology to back off right before. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. They're very smart. Uh, and ended up sort of still getting their, their first one son to go and do medicine. <laughs> yeah. All worked out. Yeah. Um, with... With med school itself, and you as a med yep. student, so you mentioned you struggled a bit, you repeated a year. Mm. Did you, what were you like as a medical student? I know there's a lot of room to like focus on other things in med school, or was med school like a big part of you, or how did you sort of view it and how were well uh, you as a med student? Yeah, I, look, I, from a student point of view, I think I was a very bad student uh, because I, I just wasn't engaged. I wasn't, it, it didn't interest me. The way they used to teach medicine back then was very, sort of didactic teaching. So it's just somebody would just read out stuff to you and you just have to copy it down and that's it. Like there was no interaction, there was no <laughs> questions, there was no thinking, there was no, um, and, and I'm, I'm the sort of person who needs to sort of see it, do it, then I learn it. Um, and so I found it really uh, not engaging for me. Um, and so as a result, I, I, get, I got distracted with, with everything else, you know, sort of uh, I had a lot of horizons expanding at that point in time. I had been very introverted up to that point. I sort of came out of my shell. So I was sort of, uh, you know, getting involved with, um, I was like DJing on radio, I was doing music producing, I was playing in bands. I was, you know, almost doing everything but medicine to a, to a degree. Um, uh, which is why I think at the end of fifth year, um, I took a, a year off um, because I realized that, look, you know, in a year's time, I'm going to be a doctor and I've never worked full time in anything in my life. I am not very focused. Uh, and I thought I, I need to at least try and, you know, see if I can, I've got the discipline to actually work full time in a job. Uh, so I worked for, uh, as a pathology collector, taking blood and um, doing that for a year. Um, and that was really good. It sort of grounded me a lot more, got me more comfortable with dealing with patients and stuff like that. Um, but I still, you know, looking back, I graduated as a very subpar student, I think. I, you know, I, I don't think I was anything um, amazing at all. Um, and, yeah, as I said, I think my journey as a doctor really just took off took off only after I graduated. And then I really became, you know, I applied myself. And, and the shift, once I had that change in, in my mindset, um, that was when I, you know, really started to blossom. And I went from being this really average, just scraping through kind of student to, you know, someone who ended up, you know, winning awards and uh, both for my doctoring and my teaching, which is like, I would never have expected that back when I was a med student. Like, I, I would never have been able to see myself in this sort of role. Um, so, yeah, it was an interesting little, little, little journey there. Yeah, I think that, that was a very vivid, very, you had a lot going on in your time as a med student. And I can see how a lot of those experiences drove you to the way you teach us as well. So not having you know, someone always talking to us, but getting us involved and getting us to do certain procedures as well. I find that you know, very engaging. Yeah, I think that was a big motivation for me to become the sort of teacher that I never had. You know, like I wanted to uh, become a teacher that, I, I wish I'd had and um, for people who learn the way that I do, um, yeah, to have someone who, who, who would help them 
uh, you know, still, and, and actually show them, you know, kind of like the way that my senior doctors took me under their wing. I wanted to do the same thing and, you know, and show them, hey, this is actually quite cool. <laughs> you know, medicine's actually quite fun. Um, so, yeah. As a med student, did you have any particular of those bright experiences with certain doctors or did that more come when you were a junior doctor? It was really when I became a junior doctor. I think I was just too disengaged when I was a student to really, like, appreciate it and i think i i, I to be honest i didn't even turn up to so much of my staff uh, you know and, and just did a lot of cramming towards the end um and so as a result i don't think i even opened myself up to those sort of opportunities as a student um and also had a fair bit of imposter syndrome going on in my head thinking oh you know should i really be here you know like am i am i good enough for this am i made am i actually you know the right sort of person to be a doctor um so i had a lot of self doubt uh, during that time. So I think it was only once I actually sort of, yeah, graduated, was sort of thrown in the deep end a little bit and, you know, but as a result started learning and then applying those lessons and, and, and becoming good at what I was doing. And then that, that gave me the confidence to sort of progress on. Yeah, I know the style of teaching has changed a lot um, nowadays, but if there are students who you know, may feel a similar way to you did when you were in med school, is there anything you would advise them to do to sort of lighten up that experience? Yeah, that's, that's a really tough one um, because, yeah, I think, you know, to a degree uh, we still teach very traditionally, like, uh, uh, you know, universities as a whole. Um, we've sort of taken a while to sort of catch on to the fact that the way that we teach isn't always the best way to teach. And, and you know, I, I did a... Uh, a graduate certificate in health professions education and one of the things that we learned from that was that the research shows that lectures you only retain about 30 percent of knowledge from a lecture <laughs> yet medicine is so heavily lecture based in particular for sort of uh two to three years so it's quite ironic that we still hold to those sort of outdated ideals um and i think now it's a lot about learning to be a bit more self-directed and finding you know if what is given or provided to you isn't really meeting your needs you need to find it elsewhere you know and luckily at least with the internet there's a lot more resources available out there and you know youtube videos and stuff like that um but i think also just talking to your uh students in your uh, above you you know in, in your senior years and, and and interns and stuff like that that also that they, they've they're always full of tips of where to go to or, or what things are worth your time um, but I think, you know, another big thing in particular for med students is that I, I sort of always like to emphasize is to do efficient study, not lots of study. Because um, you can, you know, I remember doing lots of study in my, you know, in my med student years, but it was not efficient study. So I would retain very little from that and I'd waste hours every day um, because I wasn't doing it right and i think sort of there's a lot of literature out there on 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 really good memory techniques how do you retain uh the sort of stuff that you're learning and i think that uh, that's one of the reasons why i sort of try and teach some of those techniques at the beginning um of the year when i when i teach students is that you know i want to give you guys the tools with which you can uh, you know get the most out of the teaching that i'm going to give you for the rest of the year you know because uh, there's no point me delivering it if you can't remember it you know so yeah, and, and also balance, like, you know, ha having a bit of a balance as well, you know, there's no point, um, you know, just just studying and not doing, you know, not, not having a, a balance of other activities, you know, some physical activity, hobbies, that kind of stuff. Um, you need outlets for your stress, like medicine's really stressful and it, it just gets worse <laughs> yeah, as you become a doctor, you know, the, 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 the demands just increase. So um, I think learning early on to get a good balance um, in terms of, you know, how much time you devote to your studies versus downtime and recharging time. Um, I think that's really important. Yeah, I agree. I feel like even having people or teachers or doctors involved in the teaching who understand that, I think that goes a long way um, as mm -hmm. well. Yeah, absolutely. So you mentioned a lot of the kind of uplifting experiences happen more as a junior doctor. Were there any particular rotations or experiences that you remember from those times? Um, yeah, de definitely the first two years were probably the most memorable for me, I think, um, because I was on this massive learning curve. Um, but as a result, everything was 
cool. It was interesting. It was really um, challenging. And I think that experience of sort of being thrown in the deep end and, um, you know, with real patients, their lives were in, you know, my hands and that the the seriousness of that responsibility, but then also the fact that I was able to rise to the occasion and, you know, save lives or, you know, help these people. It, um, it was really affirming for me uh, to have those experiences. And I, you know, I remember in particular my general medicine rotation as an intern, um, you know, first day on the ward, you know, my registrar said to me, oh, have you ever done a, a plural tap, which is where we sort of drain a bit of fluid out of someone's back using a needle um, to help them breathe. And I uh, said no, and he, he showed me, and, he, and then we had a whole lot of patients that needed that done. And then by day three, I'd done more than he had. And um, I think having someone show me those techniques, me doing it, me realising I can do it well, and it helps the patients was actually a really positive cycle for me. Um, and then also other sort of memorable things. I remember my psych rotation as an intern, uh, you know, we we're just chilling in the courtyard with uh, all the patients and then, you know, we we're all just chatting. And then all of a sudden one of the, one patient was like six foot one, jumps on another patient, grabs his head, starts twisting his neck. And like, I just, with things, I just jumped on him, uh, you know, put him in a bit of an arm lock. I'd, I'd done some martial arts and stuff at that stage. And then everyone sort of came in security was called, but, you know, and then asking him, you know, what, what, what just happened there? Um, and, and, you know, and, and this poor guy, he sort of said, look, you know, um, he had schizophrenia and he sort of goes, oh, the voices in my head told me that this other guy was a, a pedophile and I had to kill him, you know, and he, he just jumped and tried to kill him, you know, and I think it was eye-opening for so many reasons, you know, one, just how close a call that was for the patient, B, how close a call it was for me, uh, but see also the depth of how unwell some of these patients get and how much they they need help. Um, so yeah, I think that you know there was quite a few sort of moments like that. And then um, in second year, I did a rotation in radiation oncology at Peter Mac. Uh, so that's uh, dealing with cancer patients. And um, it was interesting, sort of after having done a lot of save, save, save type rotations. Radiation oncology is often what we call palliative, so it's all about quality of life, not quantity. Like these patients are eventually going to die from their cancer, um, and it was a lot about learning on uh, how to how to actually really best help your patient. Is saving their life always the best way? Not necessarily, but making it more comfortable and learning to take a step back and and you know learning the getting a better feel for their journey and the journey that their families go on with them. Um, I found that really, really eye-opening. And um, yeah, so I think a, a lot of my experiences from those first two years really, uh, I think, have stayed with me. Um, I feel like so. from from what you've told me, so the sort of hands-on with the plural tap and the mm. acting quickly, I can kind of tell which which field you would probably lean towards just from <laughs> those experiences as a junior doctor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's kind of funny. Yeah, I, I think, and, and that's sort of, I think, how I eventually fell into emergency. Um you know, so I, the, the first three years, as I said, were sort of full-time years, but they were what we call general years. So it was just a mix of random stuff, like a bit of everything. Um, and then I found I liked a bit of everything. I think that that really appealed to me. So that's why uh, emergency kind of works. I think a lot of people maybe in the general public don't quite understand. Uh, you know, I'll say that, you know, what was, you know, they'll ask me what sort of doctor. Yes, I'm an emergency doctor. And they go, oh, is that like a GP? It's like, no. Nah. Um, and so like GPs, we have to know about a bit about everything. Um, but different from GPs, we also need to know what's called the critical care element of it, which is life-saving stabilization for patients who are really critically unwell. Um, and that's often involves, you know, uh, uh, procedures like um, putting tubes into their people's chests or, uh, you know, sewing them up and that, that kind of stuff. So it's a little bit more hands-on and procedural in that way. So it's a like mini surgery kind of stuff as well. Um, and I think I really like that. Um, and I think I also like the fact that patients come in and you don't know what, what, what they've got wrong with them. You, you know, that's your job to find out. Um, whereas with almost every other specialty, you know, the diagnosis is usually worked out and you're just trying to manage it. Whereas for us, it's, it's that real detective style stuff. It's like, you know, they, they come in and it's a mystery. You've got to work out what the diagnosis is. Um, and I really like that intellectual challenge and, um, and that process. Yeah, that's what 
I think a lot of people not in medicine and even before I started medicine, I thought the big part was finding the diagnosis. But as I do rotations on certain other ones, I find that that that's everyone knows the diagnosis or it's not the most important part and they're just figuring out what to do from there. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think, yeah, I think that that's really true. So I think, yeah, GPs and emergency guys, we're the, we're the ones who do the most of the diagnosis sort of stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, to me, no, that's, that's, that's the fun bit. So now as an ED doctor, what does your typical week look like and has it changed um, through the past couple of years? Yeah, it's, it's a bit tricky to answer that question because I'm a CMO. So um, so I'm different from your average emergency doctor. So average emergency doctor full-time is for 10-hour shifts a week, um, whereas I only do two 10-hour shifts a week. Um, and I tend to work uh, quite late shifts. So I used to do strictly nights. So that would be 11 p.m. till 9 a.m. And I did that for many, many years until... Or only in the last three years, I've changed out a bit. So now my shifts generally go from 5 p.m. till 3 a.m. Um, and uh, my night shifts, I used to be always in charge of the emergency department. So everyone ran things by me, whereas now the 5 p.m. till 3 a.m. shifts, um, I'm just working on the floor as one of the, the senior doctors. Um, I'll still do an in charge, a couple of in charge shifts uh, a month. But um, yeah, most of the time it's not in charge anymore because I just found it was just it was burning me out a bit too much um and also the uh, by not being in charge it's enabled me to actually have students join me on my shifts and um i found that was a really good teaching opportunity for them they seem to really enjoy it and and it was really good for me too uh, i felt so yeah yeah so i wasn't actually at casey or your hospital um this past year but you offered those those night shifts during the holidays and i went to one of them and uh, just from the time perspective, I didn't, because the hospital is always illuminated and there's no windows, I didn't feel like it was the time yeah. it was until I left. Um, but for you, because you've been completing these shifts for many years, how do many you years. deal with them? And how Yeah, do you find them? It's, a, it's a good question. I mean, I, I'm a more of a night person anyway, so that's why I've, I've deliberately picked these sort of evening shifts. And the evenings and nights tend to be a lot busier than during the day. And I, I kind of thrive on that chaos a little bit. I, I, I like that. Um, so that was a deliberate choice on my part. Um, it is hard to for me to go from night sort of mode to day mode. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm not a morning person. So, uh, and you know, that the teaching has primarily been uh, during the day. So that, that's been a bit of a shift for me, but um you sort of get used to it now you know i've sort of been doing it obviously for so many years now i'm quite used to sort of essentially just jet lagging myself twice a week and i my body coats with it okay uh though i think now that i'm getting a bit older um i'm not recovering quite as quick <laughs> so but yeah is there any particular routine changes or a particular routine you have on days where you know you're working yeah so it's the night before, I will usually stay up late, which is easy for me because I'm a night person. So I'll just stay up late the night before. I'll, you know, plot around the house, play computer games or whatever. I go for a long walk in the middle of the night like I'm a weirdo. Um, so I'll, I'll quite often go for like an hour long walk at like 3 a.m. in the morning. Um, but uh, so then I can sleep during the day and I'm, I'm fully you know, refreshed. And then I will have a meal just before I start the shift. Um, and then it's a 10-hour shift. Uh and, it, you know, it, it, it ends up being without a break. I'm usually just used to sort of working straight through and then I'll, I'll come back home and I'll eat afterwards. Um, so, look, it's pretty intense. Um, you know, it's been about 13 years since I've had a meal on shift, um, which is sort of to, to answer the question of has it changed over the years? Yes, it absolutely has. So when I first started at my hospital, it was, uh, you know, it was a fairly new and it had just opened up and not many people even knew we were open um, and there would be hours sometimes that would go by where no patients would rock up at all and then now uh yeah you know we're we're kind of built for 180 patients a day and we can see up to 260 270 a day um and you know waiting times are blown out to you know sometimes seven to ten hours waiting to be seen you know which is um it, it, there's two sides to that equation. One is that a lot of people come in with things they don't need to, like they come to an emergency department when they could easily have just gone to their GP the next day um, or, or just out of convenience they'll come. Um, but the flip side of that is that some people 
might appear reasonably well when they first come in, but in that time, you know, depending on what condition they've got, they might actually deteriorate and then they suddenly, you know, deteriorate. And then, you know, you've got this patient who's uh, a lot worse off and that's, you know, can be quite stressful for someone, especially when I'm in charge, knowing that there could be, you know, one of these time bombs just sitting in the waiting room. Um, it's a hard one to work your way around when you literally don't have space to see the patients or staff enough to see the patients. Um, so yeah, it's gonna be quite challenging. I think ED is a trip that essentially everyone makes at some point in their life, whether it's for them, for their relatives. This is more like for, for you know, the general public. What can they sort of expect when they come to ED? What is the kind of procedure once they arrive there? Yeah, so when, when they come in as a patient, um, the they get seen by a triage nurse who will essentially take a quick story from them, find out roughly what's going on, uh, do what's called a set of vitals, which is like blood pressure, pulse, oxygen readings, that kind of thing. And on the basis of that, they get assigned a category of how urgently they need to be seen. Um, and the theory is that, you know, obviously ones that need to be seen urgently, they get the attention they need. Um, and, you know, you sort of get to the other ones when you can. Um, and most of the time, you know, the, the more urgent ones, you know, usually get seen uh, in a reasonable time frame. but the sort of less acute ones, uh, yeah, especially when it's really busy, you know, <laughs> yeah, they, they get seen way later, unfortunately. Um, and it's just, you know, we, we can only do what we can do. There's only so many of us and um, only so much room that we've, we've got available. Um, but the once they come in and they actually get seen by a doctor, uh, yeah, the doctor you know, takes a bit of a story, does a bit of an examination, orders some tests if they think they're necessary. And on the basis of those tests, usually either, I think a lot of people have got a bit of a misconception about emergency is that they go in there thinking, I am definitely going to get a diagnosis. I'm going to get a cure. Um, and that's not always the case. I think that a lot of what happens in emergencies is that we rule out the life-threatening things. And as long as we know it's nothing serious, then we can sort of say, look, most likely, you know, your condition is X, Y, or Z. Um, and, you know, you can sort of get that follow-up with your GP and you can try this in the meantime. Um, but it's not, it's not like sort of, you know, on TV where, you know, yeah, you you see house and there's like seven doctors working on the one patient and they've got all the time in the world to run every single test and toss it over and discuss it. It just doesn't happen that way. Um, and so as a result, um, yeah, I think sort of learning what is an emergency and what's not, I think, you know, the, the governments need to do a lot more work on trying to educate the general public on, you know, these are the times when you should come to emergency. These are the times when you don't need to, you know, and you can actually just see a GP. Um, and I think, you know, they try to do things like nurse on call to help out, but it, it ends up being a, a very, not a very useful system because the, the downfall of it is that they can only take a story over the phone, right? They can't see you. They can't do a, a pulse or a blood pressure or an oxygen reading. And as a result, they can't really make a proper assessment. They can make a, a, an educated guess but it's only part of the information you know um and so it's one of the reasons why we in the emergency department if someone calls us up and asks for advice we can't actually give it because legally we can't give it because we can't do a proper assessment um and so we usually end up having to say look if you're concerned you need to just come in and then we can check you out um and so this is where nurse on call sort of falls apart um because we're a lot of times they're in the same position that we're in they can't really make a proper assessment so they just say go to emergency anyway um and so as a result, yeah, we, we, that's why we've got such a big load of, of, of patients because, um, yeah, there's a lot of patients that probably don't need to come there but end up being sent there, you know, via things like this on call, even GPs who are too lazy or, you know, misinformation that they've read on the internet, you know, and they, they, they think they've got a condition and they haven't, but, yeah. Yeah, I find, uh, so this year I'm learning PEDS and I've heard that you know, a lot of conditions, especially parents, are very worried about their, their children and may bring them in. So along those lines for you, for someone who doesn't know like medicine, hasn't studied medicine, do you have any sort of guides you would recommend people go by to decide whether um, to come into the emergency department? And this is, where, this is where I think, again, I think the responsibility rests with the government. And I, I think that, you know, I, I floated this idea a, a few years back um, to my director to try and come up with a series of educational videos for patients. 
um, showing them, okay, this is a mild asthma, this is a moderate asthma, this is a severe asthma. If you're mild, this is what you do at home. If you're severe, this is what you do. You need to come into emergency. Because um, I think that's the only way people are actually going to learn. Um, but the problem is that trying to get it through <laughs> things like our HR and PR departments um, is a nightmare and getting the funding to develop them and all that sort of stuff. So I think this is where you know, the government's got got the, the, the money and the resources to do that. They could easily be doing something along those lines. Um, because yeah, I don't think there's a lot of, there's a lot of very unreliable resources out there. Uh, unfortunately, you know, the internet's both good and bad because there's so much information out there and, and finding out what is good, proper grounded information that's, you know, proven to be effective, um, and, and accurate versus, you know, hearsay is, yeah, it's, I think it's really hard for, for the general public. So as a result, I think in the end, a lot of times, you know, a lot of you know, as you sort of say, parents come in with their, 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 their little one and, you know, they often end up apologizing. They're going, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, I didn't mean to waste your time. And I always say, look, you know, it's not your fault. Like, you know, um, it, you know, you, you haven't had, you know, uh, the, the sort of training that, that we have because, yeah, it's just not, not, not a common thing that's taught. Um, but I like to use that as an opportunity to then teach, you know, the parents or the patients, this is what your condition is. This is when I want you to come back. This is when it's not that serious. You can go see your GP. So I like to, when I've got time, um, use that time to actually educate, you know, my, my, my patients and their families on, on stuff because yeah, it, it's, it's going to, you know, help them in the future and help us in the future, you know, it won't overload us. And it'll also mean that when they really need to come, they come, you know? Um, so, yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really good idea and something I can see we're learning to explain conditions and treatment. And I think that would definitely help with that in the future. Mm. So I think this question's coming out a little late, but in terms of your actual activities during a shift, mm. what um, what are you usually doing, and do you find yeah, any patterns? So, uh, not so much patterns. Like you know, I sort of I, I, I log on, I see which patients are in the department, um, and I can sort of read the the little triage summaries that the triage nurse has done, um, and usually on the basis of that, I I tend to try and target either the, the sickest ones that need to be seen urgently that haven't been seen yet, um, or the patients that have been waiting a longest time and like we've already ordered the tests and they've come back and I, I can pretty much, you know, say that they're okay. Uh, then I'll try and pick up those to, to sort of help them, you know, get out earlier um, and, and improve a bit of the flow in the department. Um, and yeah, you know, I'll, I'll be managing multiple patients at the same time. So, you know, I'll see one patient, order some tests or some treatment, go into the next patient, order some tests or some treatment go on to the next patient and then start following up the results of some of those tests and then going back to the other the first patient. And then, you know, so it's a, it's a lot of juggling around and, and um, multitasking. Um, but uh, I, know, I, I, I kind of enjoy that. Um, but yeah, again, a lot of the patients don't realize that that's what we're doing and they sort of feel that, you know, um, oh, you know, how come it's taking you so long to get back to me? And it's like, well, because I was stabilizing the other guy who almost died, you know, and they, they don't realize that, you know, and they um, and so, yeah, it, it's sometimes a bit tricky to sort of explain how, how it works. And, you know, a lot of times I don't realize just how much we're doing at any one time, especially when I'm in charge, you know, I'll be looking after, you know, 15 of the, the sickest patients in the department, plus supervising all my junior doctors, plus looking at, you know, every single, um, heart tracing that's done that night. Um, you know, and, and <laughs> it's, it, it's a lot of stuff that that's going on and it, um, yeah, it's, it's hard for, it's hard for patients to, to understand and realize that this is what the job involves. When I had my ED rotation, I thought the emergency department was a lot like a bee colony in mm. the sense that you have the very senior doctors and then everyone sort of sees patients and then they come back and report to them, whether it's like with an ECG reading or with their plan for the patient. I kind of imagine all the junior doctors sort of going out and then returning to report to you guys. Yeah, and, and it's, it's yeah, that, that's very similar. And you, you'll get different people, different in charge doctors run it differently. So some of them will only supervise. So they'll 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 sort of do queen bee job and sort of you know just just supervise the junior doctors. Um, I found that when I was in charge on nights, I, I couldn't afford to just do that. Like I had to also see patients myself because with my experience, I could see patients a lot quicker. Um, get things started a lot quicker. So the department would just block up and overflow if I didn't. So um, I would still do all the supervising, but I'd also see all these sick patients on top of it, which made it quite a big workload. 
hence why I'm only doing that a couple of shifts a week now. <laughs> I mean, a, a couple of shifts a month now, because um, yeah, it just got a bit too much after a while. After working there for the period of time that you have, mm. uh, any, what do you think is one of the most, one of the biggest challenges that you have? Do you think it's the number of patients or are there other things that you feel are still quite challenging? Yeah, th there's a lot of stuff that, that's quite challenging, to be honest. Um, yeah, definitely, you know, the number of patients and the, the space that we've, we've got to do it and, you know, having the, the, the staff available to actually um, help out. Um, that's not always, um, yeah, easily available to, to sort of work through. Um, and, you know, you end up sort of, especially if all the beds are full and you've got multiple ambulances that can't offload their patients, it, it, yeah, it becomes quite stressful. You end up, you know, treating a lot of your patients in the corridors and out in the waiting room. And, you know, it, in theory, it's really kind of subpar sort of medicine and that's to me, a bit stressful as a, as a doctor, especially when I'm in charge, I feel responsible for everyone. Um, and uh, as I was sort of mentioning before, you know, that, that concern that I have of like the patients in the waiting room that might actually be sicker than they look initially and they suddenly deteriorate. And, and look, it's happened. You know, we have, patient, we have patients, you know, suddenly have a cardiac arrest in the waiting room, you know, um, and, you know, because they were actually sicker than we, we realised. Um, and that's something that's quite scary you know, um, as someone who's in charge and responsible for them. Um, other things that I find stressful, uh, this sort of a sense of entitlement that sometimes you, you encounter with some patients and their families. It's like, you know, everyone believes that their problem is the most urgent, you know, um, but they don't see what we see. They don't see all the other patients and you know all the different things that are going on because they're all happening in, in, in different areas so they don't realize that we might have just spent two hours trying to save someone's life who's been critically ill um and don't get wrong they might have a broken arm which is you know to them the most serious thing that's ever happened to them so yeah i, I get that you know they're you know they're wondering you know why am i getting you know why is it taking hours for someone to see me um but they're not realizing that you know we're having to prioritize and make these split second judgment calls as to who is the you know who's the sickest patient um you know and i remember you know in terms of like some of the you know crazy experiences that i've had you know there was one night i remember we i had one patient who uh was really really sick with a urine infection and um had a blood pressure of like 60 on 40 which is really really low um, which is a sign that they were really critically ill and I was trying to do a very invasive sort of procedure to try and stabilize them. And literally just as I put this big needle into this guy's leg, a 41 year old had a cardiac arrest in the waiting room and was rushed in. And at that stage, we didn't have as much staff as we have on now. And I ended up having to um, literally stand in between the two cubicles, running two critical patients simultaneously um, and and then a, a third critical kid came at the same time, um, and I had to somehow run all three. And it was, yeah, it, it's a lot of of uh, you know sort of pretty crazy stuff that you have to make these sort of judgment calls as to okay, who's the sickest, who am I going to sign to do what, and you know what comes first. Um, so yeah, it, it 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 can be quite a challenge at times. Would you say those situations happen often? Thankfully, not too often, um, but they'll, they'll still happen, in particular on nights uh, where, where there's less staffing available. I think that, that it's more common for, for something like that to happen. Um, you know, and even just you know, recently, last couple of weeks, you know, there's been a couple of patients that have come in and you've got, you know, the three most senior doctors are all working on the one patient, but then everyone else in the department suddenly is at the mercy of my some of them very junior doctors you know and um yeah i i think it's it's, it's a really tricky balance to maintain i guess on the on the flip side um what well, does sound like there are a lot of difficulties and a lot of things you have to manage on the other side what do you find fulfilling and enjoyable and any particularly memorable experiences on the more positive side um and this is one of those real, real weird ironies of, of emergency medicine. I, I, I don't know if I'm the only one that 
but I've, I've got a feeling that a lot of people are very similar to, to me, is that we oddly don't remember the people we save because we do it so often, um, but we end up remembering the people that we lose. Um, so the patients that died, in particular, the, the kids. Um, you know, like I think if it's, you know, like a, a 90 year old who's demented and bed bound in a nursing home, you can sort of rationalize that they've had a good life and now their quality of life is bad. So you can sort of rationalize it out in your head and you, you go, oh, you know, they're, they're probably you know, suffering less now, now that they've passed. Uh, but obviously with a kid, you, you don't have that. And um, so those tend to be quite intense. And I, I remember, you know, luckily it's not that many, but there's been a, a few kids that have died, you know, where I was you know, directly involved in looking after them. And uh, you always wonder and question, you know, could I have done something differently? Or if I'd done something earlier, would that have made a difference? And, you know, medically speaking, no. You know, we, we always sort of have a debrief about these sort of things and try and work it out and case we, you know, there are things that we need to do better. And the answer is always no, but it plays on you, you know, and those sort of things stay in your head. Uh, that being said, look, you know, positive experiences um, are things like uh, I've delivered quite a few emergency babies, um, you know, just like the parents couldn't get to the maternity ward in time, so I'd deliver the baby out in the car park and that sort of stuff. Um, and um, there's been, uh, and I think, there's been a couple of times where I've run into patients that I've saved in the general public um, and, and they will recognize me first and they'll come up to me and they'll go, oh, doctor, you know, do, do you remember me? And they'll, 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 and they'll go, oh, you know, thank you for saving my life. So I think that those kinds of things are actually really quite profound. Um, and, uh, you know, in particular, when you, you get a patient that comes back to you years later and saying, you know, you're the, you're the guy that saved my life this many years ago and wasn't for you I wouldn't be here it's like that's a that's pretty cool you know that's a pretty cool kind of thing to um, experience um, other things that are kind of positive in, in, in a weird way is you know the experiences of like uh, I, I call them sexual misadventures uh, so we you know uh, people are experimenting a little bit and they end up with things in orifices where they shouldn't be and um, but, you know, it, and it's it's amusing because you sort of, you, you put yourself in that patient's position. You sort of think, oh, you know, wow, uh, that would be so embarrassing. But at the same time, you know, you're, you're also, you, you've got compassion for the patient because it would have been, you know, so embarrassing. And, you know, usually I find the best way to, to sort of manage those patients is that we, we just have a bit of a laugh about it. You know, they, they know they've done something a little bit silly. And um, and uh, at the end of the day, you know, we're, we're here to help them. So, uh, you know, we, we do that. And I, I think it, that goes down a lot better than if I sort of, you know, was all serious and like, well, why did you put that there? And, you know, be all judgmental and that kind of stuff. So um, but th th those kinds of things help to, you know, break up the, the intensity of things at times. Um, and also, yeah, being able to, to sort of uh, teach the medical students as well and sort of, you know, see them grow as medical students and then eventually as, as junior doctors, um, that's really, really rewarding for me. Yeah, on the point of patients coming up to you, I think it's nice that, you know, for doctors, you guys probably feel like you see so many patients and there's so many more patients you could see. But for the patients you helped, like you were that doctor, you were the one doctor they came when they felt really bad and you helped them. And so that impact would help them and would impact them a lot. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think, you know, yeah, um, there's a guy at my uh, local shopping center who's um, he's one of the florists in one of those little little uh, kiosks there. Um, and, and he loves to just shout out across the <laughs> across the room, you know, oh, doctor, hey, how are you going? Thank you for saving my life. You know, he's, he's really cute like that. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's, it's nice to know. Like I, I just get embarrassed, but it, at the same time, it, you know, there's also a nice feeling of, of being able to know that you've, you've made a, a difference in that person's life. I was wondering for you know, students or for junior doctors or anyone who's considering an emergency doctor and doing the things that you do, do you find there are any like make or break or very important qualities to have? Or do you feel like anyone can sort of grow to become? An emergency doctor. Um, no, I, I do believe there are there are certain qualities. Um, you you have to be able to handle the shift work, um, so that the hours can be quite hard on a lot of people. Um, it's you have to be able to handle your stress. You have to be able to manage your stress and be able to prioritize quickly and multitask. 
Um, because yeah, you know, as I said, you know, sometimes you are thrown in these situations where it's literally life or death and multiple people life or death, and you've got to work out <laughs> out of all of them which one is the most serious that and I can actually do something about. Um, so th th there's some really tough calls there, and I think emotionally you have to be quite strong because sometimes yeah, we have to end up breaking horrible news to patients that you know they've got cancer or their their loved one. There's nothing we can do to save them. You know that that's hard. Um, in particular. You know, if it's unexpected sort of illness, like, you know, especially with, you know, as I said, like a child or something like that, that that's horrible, and it takes a it takes a toll. Um, so you have to be quite um, mentally strong. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a subject for a whole new podcast, you know, mental health and medicine. But um, learning to be self aware of when you're burning out. I think is really important in emergency and we're not good at it as a whole. Um, you know, I've had multiple colleagues uh, commit suicide because, you know, um, the work pressures take a toll on things like their the rest of their life, so their family life, their relationships. And, you know, when you combine all those stresses together, um, that's pretty intense stuff. And we're not, you know, the, all the health networks love to talk about you know look after your mental health you know socks for docs and all that sort of stuff and but we're in practice they're not very good at actually helping their staff get through and that's just my opinion but a lot of the times like say for example you know after a patient dies we have a, a thing called a debrief where the, the team sort of gets together and we try and talk it over and make sure that we're all okay and, and stuff like that but half the time like I know for myself at any rate, it's usually too busy for me to actually even attend that because um, there's other patients that are still alive that I've got to focus on. Um, and so I don't get a chance to debrief. And then we get like maybe I think three sessions a year or something with a, a, a therapist that, uh, are pay, uh, subsidized or paid for by, uh, by the health network. But that's not a lot when you consider, you know, the sort of environment that we're in. Um, so yeah, I think you know being able to be self-aware and have those self-care things are really important uh, as well. So that there are other things that I think are really important, and and having a good work ethic as well. You, you get some doctors who do emergency, but they're they're a bit too lazy, I think, and um, and they I don't think they should be doing that sort of job if they're if they've you know they want to they want a, a sort of cushy job where they can sit back in an office and you know slowly go through things. That's not an emergency department, you know. Yeah. I, uh, past year, so last year was my first year of proper clinical placement. And I did have a couple patients who passed, but they weren't, but I can't imagine what it's like for you guys. Cause you guys were you know, engaging with them, talking with them, examining them, looking at their results, like really getting to know them. And then that happens. So yeah, yeah I, I can't imagine how tough and difficult that was. Yeah. Be. I think that's tricky. I mean, to a degree, it's a little bit easier on us compared to say some of the other specialties where you get to know the patient a lot. Like say, for example, when I was doing the radiation oncology at Peter Mac, but the cancer patients, you would, spend, you know, every day you would see these patients. So you really get to know them. You get to know their families really well, you know, um, and when they pass, um, you know, some of them, even some of the families would invite me to their funerals and stuff. And it was like, that was harder, I think, because you, you really form a bond with the patients. Um, but it's never easy, you know, I, you know the, the, the amount of times that, you know, you will break news to someone that they've got cancer and, then, you know, essentially it's incurable, um, you know, and then, you know, the wife bursts into tears and, you know, you're, you know, the, the husband's trying to be all stoic and stuff and you're, you 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 can't help but feel those emotions as well, but you kind of got to hold it together for them, you know, to be strong for them. But at the same time, you don't want to shut off your emotions completely and become this, you know, stereotypical, you know, feelingless doctor either, you know. Um, so it, it's, yeah, it's this really tough line to, to, to walk. Um, and again, as well, that self-care and, and mental health stuff comes into play. Yeah. Thank you for, for sharing that. And I was wondering if you'd be open to talking a bit about how you've learned to manage those situations when those happen. Are there any particular yeah. things you find helpful? Um, yeah, is this a, 
I'll probably have to send you a, a, a link to this separately because I, 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 I've actually had another uh, filmmaker do a little mini documentary on my, on, on my, my thoughts on mental health and medicine and, and stuff like that as well. But um, in brief, um, I found that it's it's really important to be able to find a few colleagues that you can debrief with at some stage, you know, just, just people in the, in, the, in the field. Because even if you've got the most empathetic partner in the world, um, you know, or, or empathetic friend, if they're not in the industry, it's really hard for them to understand what it is that we go through. You know, a bad day for someone in IT is that, you know, the computer server crashes and, um, you know, people get angry at them and, um, you know, they've got hours of work ahead of them. Uh, a bad day for us is that the computer crashes, uh, we've got hours of work ahead of us and people get angry at us but also people die so we've got all of those things plus people die um and that's you know or, or they could be left with you know serious um you know side effects or whatever um and so i think that that kind of stuff uh the weight of that pressure is not something that a lot of people will ever understand unless they've actually been in that situation yeah, thanks. I, I think that would definitely help some people out. And I'm happy to pop the link in the in the description as well. Yeah. In case people and, want and to actually, watch it. And actually just getting a therapist. Like uh so I've actually only recently just done that now. Uh so yeah, at the end of last year was when I first started, you know, started my sessions. Um and it's taken me this long. Like and then you know, that's one of the ironies of medicine. It's like, you know, yeah, we, we, we preach, you know, all this self care and, and and mental health stuff. Uh yet at the same time, there is this subconscious uh, thing that pervades through medicine that we need to be, we are doctors, we are, you know, we're meant to be these invulnerable bastions of knowledge that are unshakable, you know, um, and that's such a, a myth, really, you know, because we're human, you know, we are going to have our bad days, we're going to have our days that we can't handle what's put in front of us. Um, and I think, you know, we're going to have days that we make mistakes, unfortunately. Um, and so I think, you know, doctors needing to be more aware of their own humanity and their own frailties and being okay with that, because I think we're, we're very unforgiving of ourselves uh, in those sort of scenarios. Um, and that could be a very unhealthy sort of uh, path to go down. So I think sort of being a lot more open and, and you know having these conversations so you know uh with, with that that video the whole point of that video was to open up the conversation and show that yes even someone like myself who a lot of people view as very very successful and always seems to have your shit together uh i don't you know i, I the, the, the plain fact of the matter is i don't um i don't always have my shit together and i fail i have the same insecurities that so many people have um doubts poor self-image self-worth um you know uh, you know and, and and you know when you get stuck in a negative cycle you know even you know depressive thoughts and and that sort of stuff so i think that being open about that and saying it's okay you know I, I, corny as it's okay to not be okay but it, it's so true though about more people need to show up people in these positions where um the, in these positions of respect you know or high achieving people to actually keep that conversation open and going i think is really, really important um because yeah otherwise people just see the highlight reel you know they just see the you know the social media like everything seems to be going well it's amazing you know you're achieving so much Woo. um i want to be like you and it's like yeah you know the, the, don't go wrong yeah I, I am achieving all those things but you know the, there are all these other things as well um and i think that's really important yeah i think it's really good to hear that i think just just hearing that and just speaking about it is you know, very helpful and very good for mm people med students doctors to hear about yeah yeah because like you know i when i released my video and I, I talked about things you know along those lines of my own mental health journey and and my failings in that um the feedback that i got was that yeah you know like the universities and the health networks always preach about it but they don't no one in these higher positions demonstrates it no one uh 
shows their own vulnerability and opens up and says, this is my journey. I'm like you. It's okay. Um, and so that's why I sort of really thought that that was quite important to, to show. So just zooming out on your whole time as a junior doctor up till now, um, so you mentioned radiation oncology. I was wondering, were there any particular experiences or rotations, do you think, that helped you be a better emergency doctor or contributed a lot to what you do day I to think, day? I think they all did um, because, you know, I learned stuff in, in every different rotation I did, you know, and I, I think, you know, as my advice to, in particular, you know, newly graduating doctors uh, going into their intern year and, and stuff like that, it's, it's a lot about don't, feel pressurized to specialize straight away um, take your time to work out what works for you and take into account both the actual content of what you're actually you know dealing with day to day um, but also the lifestyle you know uh, are the hours something that is going to be suitable for you in where you're at in your life stage you know in particular if you've got you know relationship family uh, that kind of stuff um, i think it's really important to take those things into account early um, because people don't realise just how much of a toll that's going to take on them, you know, like working full time plus studying for their specialty. They literally have no other time left and any relationship is going to suffer unless you've got a good foundation built first. Um, and so I think that with a lot of people, uh, they don't realise the amount that the sort of toll that that's going to potentially take. So I think keeping all those things in mind are, are really important. But in terms of purely doctoring stuff i think i'm really glad that i did that rotation at peter mac with the cancer patients because yeah as i said a lot of doctoring stuff is about save 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 and that was teaching me to learn how to take a step back and to um focus on okay am i actually doing more harm than good you know hippocratic oath is first do no harm and a lot of the times medical stuff does harm ironically you know uh you know chemotherapy uh, yes, it might cure your cancer, but it will also potentially make you feel horrible for years and even leave you with side effects that will affect you for the rest of your life, you know. Um, and so, uh, you know, having that balance of really asking myself and learning to ask myself that question almost whenever I've got a critical patient, you know, how much is the right amount to do for this patient? Am I really doing them a favour? by saving their life because their life post this might be absolutely miserable. Yeah, I've definitely experienced that in the hospital as well, especially when people bring up the idea of like palliative care. I think a lot of people are really big on, you know, I'm going to fight the disease. I'm going to you know do this, do that. And even, you know, for me, sometimes I'm a bit you know, taken aback at the idea of palliation because you always feel like you want to hit the disease head on. But as you've said, that experience at radiation oncology, yeah, it was good. And, the and it's not so much that, you know, say, for example, you know, it's not that you give up a fight. Um, so say, for example, if, if they've got terminal cancer, it's spread everywhere. We're never going to be able to cure them of that cancer and they're going to eventually die from that cancer. But what I learned from working with those patients was that the ones that did the best overall were the ones that had a really good outlook. And their outlook was to just enjoy the time that they had you know, to really appreciate every moment. Um, and so they were still fighting it, but it was a, it was a difference. It's a, it's a mindset change fighting. Um, you know, yeah, medically, there's a limit to how much you can fight it, but emotionally, mentally, um, there's a, so much more that goes into it. And the ones that, you know, I could see, you know, actually were enjoying their life, even up to the point where, you know, just before they died, um, it was those ones who had changed their mindset. Whereas there was others that sort of focused on the negative aspects of their cancer, that I'm going to die, I'm miserable, I'm in pain. And don't get me wrong, they are, they are t they're totally valid emotions. It didn't seem to help them that much though. Um, and so, yeah, you know, it taught me a lot for myself, you know, in terms of the way I, I, I approach my own life, you know, uh, learning to really appreciate things well, you know, for, in the moment as well. Yeah, we definitely learn things from patients as well and that whole experience. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, just to cap off the emergency doctor strictly medicine aspect, I was yep. wondering if you could uh, give me a rating out of 30 for a couple aspects 
of sure of the specialty i, I guess it was a okay. point it can be a point of comparison just your personal sure. opinion um so firstly how difficult do you think it was to enter into emergency medicine um so the, the caveat here is that I've not actually done the sort of formal emergency medicine training because, you know, as I said, I'm a career medical officer. Um, so I think the journey for those guys is a lot harder because, as I said, you know, like, you, you know, working full time plus the study plus trying to balance your life on top of that. Um, I don't know. I, I, I think that's pretty, pretty full on. And uh, one of the reasons why I chose to be a career medical officer, I didn't want to go through that. Uh, so it was a, a very deliberate choice on my part. Um, in terms of getting into it from my, the pathway that I took um, was surprisingly easy. Um, they always need good emergency doctors and people who thrive under their chaos and that, that sort of chaos. Um, and so from that point of view, I guess I'd rate that a, maybe like a 25 out of 30 type thing. Um, but yeah. Uh, so secondly is how in control of your time are you? So with 30 being like completely in control, lots of freedom and then yep. zero. The um, I would say for me as a, as a career medical officer, it's about 25. So it's pretty damn good. Um, so the, the, the difference being is that if I was a consultant, I would still need to do on call, which would change things a bit. Um, Whereas as a career medical officer, once I finish my shift, that's it, I'm done, uh, which is really good. Um, the, the only reason why I didn't give it a 30 is that um, because of the nature of my job, um, you know, you can have a critical patient come in 15 minutes before you're meant to finish your shift. And you can't just sort of handball that to the next guy and say, okay, you deal with it, my, my, my shift is over, <laughs> you know. Um, so you usually need to try and sort of get it as sorted as you can before you sort of hand them over. Uh, so, that, you know, there's easily been times where I've done an extra sort of, you know, two, three hours after my shift over time just because of situations like that. And it takes literally that long to stabilise them and then document everything. Um, so, you know, and that's on top of a 10-hour straight shift already. So, you know, it, it could be pretty full on. But um, overall, I've actually got pretty good control over, over my time. Okay, that's good. Um, and finally, with uh, the, so the final rating out of 30 is how different would each day be in terms of what you do during your shift? So 30 being that each day is really, really different and zero being it's pretty similar, pretty routine. Um, it, it, it's routine in its difference, if that's... <laughs> so in other words, like every shift is different. Like you, you never know what's going to walk in the door um you know we'll often get runs of like you know there'll be five people with gallstones and then the next day it's like you know five people with heart attacks uh you know for, for whatever reason sometimes they come in runs where there's just a lot of one condition um so you, you never know what's going to walk in the door um but in the sense that's the consistency so you know the fact that it, yeah it's always going to be something different um and I, I think that's probably the reason why I, I do like it you know yes to a degree you know, it's less common for something to really come up that's a real mystery uh, or that really throws me. Um, but if anything, like, you know, when those things do happen, they're the ones that I get even more interested in because I, I really, you know, it's more of a challenge. Um, so, yeah, I don't know, maybe a 20 out of 30. I don't know. That was a hard one to answer. Yeah, hard one to rate. Um, okay, next, I wanted to ask you a little bit about teaching. So sure. when I met you, you were, you know, John, clinical dean of, of the hospital, of the clinical school. What was your, like, how did you become involved with teaching and arrive to where you are now? Yep, so um, it actually goes all the way back to med schooling days. Um, so, you know how I said I repeated my first year. Um, so that was my mum got cancer during that time and I just wasn't focused and then uh, ended up sort of failing one subject and having to repeat the whole year because of that. and. Um, but as a result, though, the second time round, I pretty much knew almost everything already. And in particular, the one subject I really enjoyed was anatomy, and I was quite good at that. Um, and so I started, ended up tutoring anatomy uh, just, just privately to, to uh, you know, my new colleagues in, in first year. Um, and then I became quite good at that. And, um, and so I ended up doing it for all the successive year levels while I was in, in my preclinical years. Um, and, uh, you know, it got to a point where I was tutoring, you know, 30 odd 
students a week. Um, so it was, it was quite quite a lot. Um, but that's how it started. And I, I realized that I really had a, a passion for teaching. And then um, also as I became more senior as a doctor um, and I'd have junior doctors you know, reporting back to me, as we talked about before, um, when, when they go see a patient, they come back and they tell me what they think is going on. Um, I found that I was really enjoying the teaching aspect there as well. Um, but in particular, though, I was noticing that they were, some of them were making the same sorts of mistakes that I did when I first graduated. And I thought, hold on, you know, that there's, we could, we must be missing something a little bit when we in our med school teaching, if people are still making the same kind of mistakes that I was making. And a lot of it was based around getting very tunnel visioned into thinking a condition can only present one way. Um, so for example, uh, the, the clots in the lung are a really classic one, what we call the pulmonary embolus. Um, the classic textbook description is sudden onset chest pain, which is worse when you take a deep breath in and you're, uh, you get associated difficulty breathing with it. But in real life, uh, maybe only 60% of patients actually present that way. And there's a good 40% um, that don't. But the amount of times, you know, I'd have even sort of fairly senior doctors say to me, oh, it can't be that condition because they didn't have chest pain. I was like, well, no, it still could be, you know, because I've seen it many times. Um, and so that was another reason why it sort of motivated me to want to teach. So anyway, I started, um, one of my colleagues had been doing some teaching a bedside teaching for um, year three students and um, then she couldn't do it and she sort of said oh would you be interested in doing it so I said yeah I'll give it a shot so I start off as what we call a bedside tutor get you know sort of six students and we we go around we we visit real patients and we talk to them and and try and work out what's going on and use that as part of their learning thing um, so I started off with that and then I sort of said at the time to um, the guy that was in my my current role, I sort of said to him, well, you know, look, I, I've also saved up all these x-rays over the years of really interesting cases. Um, I could give a talk on, on x-rays. So I started doing that and um, that, that went down really well. And then they said, oh, can you do more? And so I, I started to do a, a series on, on, on different things that I thought I wish someone had taught me better or, you know, some, some of the lessons that I've learned over the years that I thought were really useful and I only learnt them through the patients that I saw. Um, and so that's why my, my lecture series is based on real cases of, of patients that I've seen over the years. Um, and then in particular, so I started off at just my hospital. Uh, and then when COVID hit, um, I started doing it online and found that my series adapted pretty well to online. And um, so that was great for all the students that couldn't get into the hospitals due to COVID. Um, and also because of, and we'll get to this in a little bit, uh, you know, with my background in um, photography and also in music producing and sound engineering, I was able to, I was quite keen to sort of see audio visually, how could I bring the patients to the students, even though they weren't physically able to get into the hospital. So I started looking a lot into using GoPros and videos and digital stethoscopes in terms of how to enhance my a teaching material um, and it ended up being that they actually work really quite effectively even post COVID they're still quite quite useful the students seem to, to find that a, a really useful way of teaching so um, yeah that's how I eventually and then the, the guy that was in my current role um, ended up having a lot of other things that other responsibilities that he had to do in, in his doctor job uh, and so I ended up taking over the role that I'm in, in now at, at my hospital. Yeah. Wow yeah I yeah I really enjoy how the lectures are very engaging from different aspects like it's there's you talking there's you showing cases there's blood results and there's a procedural video usually as well at the end of end of the lectures and yeah I think you know, the students really appreciate that yeah I think it just it makes it more real to them and I think you know that, that the problem with self-directed learning from third fourth and fifth year in medical school is that it's targets of opportunity if there's a good case they're great you get to see you get to learn from it but otherwise it's very hit and miss you can spend a whole day in the hospital and not really see much that is necessarily that, that useful um whereas i know what the students kind of need to to learn so i can actually you know particularly you know video cases that are going to be useful for them and uh, and the patients are, uh, are always very surprising, very uh, keen to help and 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 teach the 
the doctors and, and, and contribute to their education. So, um, yeah, they're, they're happy to help out. And we, we, we do these videos. And, um, yeah, I think, you know, it's one thing for me to tell a story. There was this patient that was really sick. But to see a patient that is really sick is a totally different thing. And I think for students, it really sticks in so much better when they can see it with their own eyes, hear it with their own ears, you know, hear the words from the patient themselves um, versus me telling a story. It's a totally different sort of experience, I think, and, and learning learning experience, yeah. With your sort of developing involvement in teaching and your experience with med students, even since you were a med student, mm -hmm. do you feel like there have been changes that have been happening in each cohort or the med students... Are they still uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, because, because teaching itself has changed. So, you know, back when I did, as I said, it was very didactic and, and <laughs> frankly boring um, and ineffective, really. Um, uh, so that's changed. So the teaching style has changed to a degree. Um, I think there's a lot more that can be done, obviously. Um, but also in the cohorts, in particular COVID, COVID made a huge impact on the you know, on the medical students. And I think now with this big shift to online teaching for a lot of stuff, because um, I think when, when COVID hit, all the unis were in a bit of a panic. They're like, how do we still pass our students and educate them um, when we've got no material ready to roll for online um, in, in that format? And so I think in particular, the, the students that went through in first and second year during that time um, ended up getting sort of, I don't know if this is the right word, but almost sort of spoon fed a fair bit, just because the, the, the unis were so desperate to make it as easy as possible for them to get through um, and didn't want them to have a bad experience that they sort of made it really um, like almost helicopter parented teaching <laughs> of, of, of the students. And so as a result, uh, from third year onwards, which is a lot of self-directed stuff, you're in the hospitals, you're having to self-initiate contact with patients. I think that that was actually a really hard thing for a lot of the students to then suddenly have to adapt to. Um, and, you know, just their experience with interacting with other humans, you know, had been so so different up to that point, let alone with, with complete strangers and, and, and patients. So, um, I mean, now, you know, that's slowly starting to, to decrease a little bit, um, but uh, yeah, it, that, that's sort of definitely had a bit of an impact. Um, but overall, like, you know, we, we always find that, you know, in third year, everyone comes in really anxious and that it seems like there's so much to learn. I, I'm sure you can remember back to the start of last year. I'm sure, you know, yeah, it, you know, it always seems like there is so much stuff that you have to learn. Um, and you sort of think, how am I ever going to get to, you know, when you see some of the doctors do their things, like that seems like slight years away from where I am at the moment. But I think, you know, and but we always get you there, you know, by the end of the year, you sort of realize, Oh wow! I am actually doing this, and I, I know what I'm talking about. I, I I know the questions to ask, and I know what those answers mean. You know, and it's like, huh, it actually does fit. Um, so yeah, that's why I really love teaching third year. I think it's where you know I love that whole the jigsaw puzzle pieces of the puzzles just slowly fitting together. And it's like, ha, huh, this is actually quite cool. This is fun. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like this year or the past year is one where I really learned a lot, and you know, through patience, I'm more motivated to also sharpen my history taking my exam examinations and like actually seeing signs that's been a great learning great learning experience yeah and i think you know also being able to see the impact we can have you know you can you see these patients when they're at their sickest and then you see them when we discharge them and they're like totally different person it's like damn that's actually a good feeling you know it's a really nice to know that yeah i picked up what was wrong i knew how to treat it and look at them now you know that yeah there's a, there's a bit of a buzz to that. I was wondering if you could share a bit about Trek Medic. I know people might not be familiar sure. with that. Like... Yeah, so Trek Medic was a little organization that we formed back in 2011. Well, officially formed in 2012, but our first Trek was in 2011. So it, it actually all started with uh, this is back in the days when the nights just weren't that busy. And one of the nurses said randomly, Hey guys, you want to go to Everest? <laughs> and um, we said, yeah, let's do it. Uh, and we, it was kind of funny because he had never even been camping in his life, let alone overseas, let alone to Everest. Uh, but anyway, um, you know, a few of us got together and we decided to go. And uh, I think, uh, by memory, I think 18 of us went over. Um, and then when we 
we also so we went to Nepal and um, went up in the mountains. And um, but because we we sort of did some research, we realized that you know Nepal is actually uh, an area that's um you know very third world country, and um, medically uh, you know a lot of these remote areas uh, are, are in a lot of need. Uh, we decided to make it a, a medical mission as well. And so um, we we sort of went up to base camp, and then we also sort of went out into the um, Annapurna region, up into the remote mountains in the over there, and uh, just going from village to village, just checking and treating patients that we saw there. Um, and when we came back, it was meant to be just a one-off, but when we came back, um, it sort of really struck a chord with about five of us, and we decided to officially form in 2012, the next year. Um, and then since then, we've seen easily over 10,000 patients there. Uh, we've helped out in the um, 2015 earthquakes that struck Nepal. We had a, a rolling, um, sent teams in for rolling support over three months. Um, also led a team to Kenya as well. And uh, yeah, I think it's a, a really, for me, it's got multiple sorts of things. You know, one, we can make a difference in some of these people's lives. Uh, you know, often many have never seen a doctor or dentist ever in their entire life. Um, but two, it's it also does something for us as people from a first world country medical background going into these areas. And we, I find that it's a real wake up call to remind me to be grateful for everything that I have. Um, because these guys are so poor, you know, the things that we take for granted, you know, like I flick a switch and electricity comes on, you know, I flush a toilet and it flushes. Uh, whereas over there, it's it's totally different. You know, you don't, don't have all those sorts of things. And when it comes to medicine, it's like, okay, say, for example, something as simple as rolling over and breaking your ankle. Yeah, you call an ambulance, bring in hospital, sorted. Crutches, everything, all good. There, it's a six-hour hike to the nearest health post up a mountain, uh, you know, and sometimes in a monsoon season where it's raining and there's leeches everywhere. Um, and it just suddenly, everything suddenly just escalates in terms of difficulty, you know, and if there's something critical, it's not nothing, they just die. You know, it, it's really quite, uh, quite striking the contrast and what we take for granted, you know, yeah, we, 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 we moan about, you know, having to wait for four hours in an emergency department, you know, uh, <laughs> when you contrast, you know, like even some of the, you know, the, the, the major teaching hospital in there, um, when I first went there um, in 2011, like they were, they were cramming three patients to a bed, not related. They would, they're just, just because they didn't have any space, so three patients fit on a bed, uh, you know, and there was a young kid who was like, I think he was like six, 16 or 15 or something, and he'd fallen off a double story building, smashed open his skull. He was unconscious and normally that patient would have been rushed into what we call our resuscitation area, um, intubated, stabilized, intensive care, immediate neurosurgery. Over there, he was in the back room, not intubated because he was still breathing for himself, but totally unconscious, just waiting for uh, the theatres to become ready, which was going to be like another 12 to 24 hours. Uh, and it was just, yeah, it was, it was pretty mind blowing for me as, as a medical professional, knowing that this is what I would do in this situation normally, and it's not being done because they just don't have the resources to do it, you know? So I think that, yeah, that was very eye opening for me. So, um, yeah, so I've been sort of going back there. So predominantly we do work in Nepal, um, but yeah, I have done some stuff in Kenya and potentially looking at other countries in the future, but, um, yeah. How do you manage that sort of contrast in your mind? Cause I feel like you know, you're working in a, in a metropolitan hospital. It's like this. The patients are like this. These problems get treated mm. like in this way. And then it, you get to a completely actually, different place. Yeah, it's actually at times actually very demoralizing because you know that in a first world country, this would have been easy. You know, I would be able to send them to this hospital and they'd be sorted and it'd be free. Um, whereas over there, the logistics element, A, just getting them physically to a place like, you know, can they physically be transported uh, safely to, a, you know, or can they walk safely to a place where they can get a lift to go down uh, to the nearest hospital, which may be still hours away? Um, and even then, can they afford any treatment there? Because uh, even their public hospital systems, they still charge you for stuff. Um, and they are so poor. Um, so I've seen people fall, you know, like four metres out of a tree 
fracture their spines and all they were given was a bandage, which does nothing for a fractured spine uh, because that's all they could afford. And they were sent home and, you know, they've got this misshapen spine that's healed so badly because they never got the, the right treatment. So um, I think that um, it's... It's, so that, that side of things can be quite demoralizing. Um, in recent years with Trek Medic, when we've encountered patients that needed more advanced treatment that we couldn't offer on the spot because we're limited by what we can carry, um, we've been doing things that like we sort of fundraise when we get back and um, uh, help try and get them the, the treatment that they need in the, in the local hospitals. Um, but even then, it's still really, really difficult and often takes way longer than it should just because of the logistics that are involved. Um, yeah, with, with those kinds of things. So it, it's hard. It, it is really hard, I think, and it, it's very eye-opening. Um, so yeah, for, for people who uh, have only worked in first world medical, it's really quite a confronting experience at times. Just to tie off this segment of Trek Medic mm -hmm. and teaching. So in the holidays, I went on one of the disco shifts with you. Mm -hmm. When did you actually start Okay, you could explain what disco shifts are. Some people might not know, <laughs> okay. and how you yeah. came up with it. Okay, so the the, the disco shift essentially was um, yeah, it's this five pm to three am shift that I do, um, and it's, it's it's called the disco shift because allegedly that's when people go out to the discos. Discos, who uses that word anymore? Um, just shows how how long that kind of thinking has been around. Um, and it used to be a, a thing that in, in some emergency departments I would do it, but at the moment I'm the only one who doesn't um, in, in in my my particular hospital. Um, but it, it just works well in terms of timing. But I sort of found that, um, yeah, it allowed me to take students with me one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I could actually then sort of give them really one-on-one -on -one teaching uh, that was really useful for them and that they sort of found that really good feedback. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and I, I often use those um, to get more video footage that I would then record and upload as yeah, again, stuff to help other people who weren't able to, to be there on that day. Um, and I guess that's the benefit of, of, of video and um, online teaching now. Yeah, I feel like uh, in my shift, in the shift we had particularly, I felt a little bit like a mini intern, which was kind of mm -hmm. a nice, like you would send us off to see patients. We'd tell you about the patient and you sort of guide us from there and then we type up the notes. I kind of liked feeling a bit like a doctor before becoming a doctor. Absolutely, yeah, and I, you know, I, I wish we'd had more of that um, when I was going through med school. You know, I think now your final year is is similar to that in a lot of ways, um, which I think is a great idea. Um, to yeah, because I remember my first, my very first day as an intern, getting on the ward, and within like two minutes of me arriving on the ward, one of the nurses came up to me and said, "Oh, this is one of the patients that uh, you guys are looking after. Um, they've got a potassium of two point seven. Uh, what do you want to do about it?" And I'm like, okay, I knew I had to give potassium, but I'd never ordered it. I'd never, I don't know how much, I don't know, you know, how quickly. It just, it was just something that I'd never really experienced before. And that was the first time I sort of learned to go, okay, well, what would you guys normally do? And I, I literally just asked her that. Um, and I, I began to, you know, learn as a result of that, um, you know, uh, the practicalities of medicine. But again, this is where, you know, I, I think I would have loved that in med school. I think it would have made it a lot more real to me because it, it sort of felt very, the practice of medicine still felt very distant to me as a student. Whereas, um, yeah, once I actually got in there and doing it, it was like, oh, no, I actually like this. Yeah, that's definitely useful. And I, I think, you know, future students will definitely enjoy it and learn a lot from mm. it as well. Yeah. Um. So finally, with your hobbies, hmm. how... Like, did they start when you were in high school and how have you been able to maintain them up to now? Uh, yeah, so that's a, that's a good question because some of them were, were hobbies and then some of them end up actually becoming, you know, proper careers. Um, but yeah, I, I think I, I started, I've always had a bit of a creative side. So I started with um, <laughs> like every Asian kid doing piano and violin. That's so racist to me, but anyway. Um, so I did that as a kid. Um, didn't really enjoy it at that time. Um, and then in high school, in my really rebellious phase I, I learned flute <clears throat> um and then um uh but what, one of the interesting things about my high school music teacher uh one of the high school music teachers that i had was that he was really cool and there was this one day that he got the whole class together and everyone got to try everyone else's instruments and um one of those instruments was a, a drum kit and i actually really enjoyed that and so i went out and bought myself a pair of drum sticks couldn't afford a kit but 
um, I would just, you know, listen to music and try and work out how to play the beats. And then um, this is before the days of YouTube videos and stuff like that. And um, and then I got a chance to play on a drum kit about two years later and realized I could play drums. I was like, oh, this is really cool. Um, and then uh, in first year of uni, well, actually my second first year of uni, I met a girl who played sax and she goes, oh, did you know that the fingering for sax is the same as for flute? I go, no. She goes, do you want to borrow my sax? I don't use it anymore. I go, yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, within two hours, I learned how to play a new instrument, which was pretty cool. Um, and so I ended up then getting quite heavily into a lot of the music stuff in my uni years. Uh, so yeah, I was music producing um, and then uh, DJing, um, ended up being on radio um, and uh, being an on-air host there and, and got introduced to all the dance music stuff and electronica. Um, and then, um, so that carried sort of all the way through med school um, into my early I think intern year, I, I dropped off a bit because I was just too busy. Um, but then second year, third year out, sort of got back into it again. But then through that, I ended up, um, so through the music, some of my singers needed photos done for their album covers and promotional sort of stuff. And um, they were getting quoted ridiculous prices to get their photos done. And up until that point, I'd done a, dabbled a bit in photography, but just taking photos of sunsets and dead trees and stuff like that, not, not, not people. Um, and, but I said, look, you know, hey, uh, I've never done photos of people before, but could give it a shot. Um, and so I, I started taking some photos of them and they turned out really good. And, um, and then towards the end of 2004, I met a talent agent from the US who was touring Australia and I showed him my photos and he goes, oh, this is actually better than what we've got on our website. And I thought, oh, okay, maybe I better take it a bit more seriously then. So I put a bit more effort into it, um, you know, upgraded my gear. Uh, did a lot of photo shoots for like 50 bucks um, and then um, launched my website in March 2005. Uh, and then I just had this really rapid rise in, in the photography world. Um, so I was still working as a doc by this time, but then part time. Um, but yeah, like within sort of six months, uh, some of my shoots were sort of uh, being published in magazines. And then I started working for Miss World within two years and um, started. Uh, and then when So You Think and Dance came out started working for them and uh, through that some of the Channel 10 stuff um, and then all the, the different dances and stuff like that. So I, I had a lot of doors open for me pretty rapidly. Um, and then in 2010, I decided that I wanted to learn makeup as well. So I did that and um, yeah, that sort of took off. So, so for quite a while until about probably 2015, uh, so from 2005 to 2015, so a good 10 years, um, I was shooting pretty heavy. So I'd be like two nights a week as a doc and then doing two or three photo shoots a week. Um, wow. And yeah, so that, that balance was like pretty crazy. Like I was burning the candle at both ends, but I was loving it. Like it was fun. Like I really enjoyed it, you know, um, and uh, had a great time. You know, I was still playing in some bands and stuff at the time and, yeah, you know, got the got the jam with Matchbox 20 and stuff. <laughs> so it was, it was a pretty crazy sort of time in my, my life. But um, then after a while, I sort of, it was interesting. I sort of started to phase out of the photography. I sort of, reached a point where I was kind of happy with what I'd achieved in it but I also got a bit disillusioned with the industry in the sense of I felt that it wasn't taking enough responsibility for how much it contributed to things like um, uh, eating disorders and, and self-image disorders and stuff like that um, because I had you know I uh, had a number of friends both uh, in the industry, in the fashion industry, but also out of the industry, who suffered from these eating disorders, and I realised that with all my photo shoots, I'm taking photos of these, uh, you know, predominantly pretty women who were, uh, you know, I'd put on hair, makeup, lighting, and then on top of that, I'd be photoshopping them into this actually unrealistic, you know, uh, sort of final product and then I'd be uploading them onto my social media. I had a fairly big following on Facebook at the time. Um, it was sort of a bit before Instagram and um, realizing that, you know, me doing uploading these shoots every, you know, few days, I'm contributing to this, you know, unrealistic uh, body image. And um, yeah, it, it kind of made me sort of want to take a step back from it all. And, and I, I didn't really like the superficiality of the industry and, um, there's also a few photographers which I had initially mentored um, who ended up sort of using their position to essentially be dodgy buggers um, and try and take advantage of some of their young models. And I and it kind of just left me with a bad taste how that was still sort of overlooked by the industry. Like, you know, the, 
big modeling agencies were still happy to use these photographers. It's like, are you kidding me? Like, you know, they're essentially sexual predators, but yeah, I don't know. It, it sort of left me with a really bad taste in my mouth and I, yeah, decided that no, nah, I wanted to sort of fail, drop back on that. And then eventually, um, yeah, COVID hit and obviously couldn't really do any shoots at all during that time. And then had to spend a lot of time getting the material right for teaching the med students online. So, and then that, that's now become my, my new thing. So, yeah. Yeah, that's I think it's, the, the journey. it's really good to hear about the places you took and the activities you participated in as well. And I think it's very encouraging because it means that, you know, people can have activities and can do those activities to a high level as well and be you know, a doctor and study medicine. Uh, absolutely. And I, I think that was one of the, the misconceptions I had when I was in medicine. I think one of the reasons why I initially didn't, apply myself was because I was depressed and I was depressed because I thought that once I graduated, that's going to be the end of my life. Like it's just, I'm going to be a doctor. That's it. I don't have a life outside of medicine, you know, because that's the impression that I got. Um, but that's actually such a, a falsehood. And I think in particular in recent years, there's been a big shift to lifestyle changes amongst doctors. I've realized that it's crazy to, you know, work the hours that we do under the conditions that we do. Um, and there's been a big shift to lifestyle changes that are, you know, more flexible. Um, and so, yeah, you know, there's actually whole Facebook groups, you know, uh, devoted to, you know, doctors with other interests outside of medicine, you know, which I think is great. You know, and I, I think that, um, you know, the more people realize that the better it is. And, and for a number of reasons, you know, one, for those of people who've, who've got these, you know, things that they want to do outside of medicine, you know, they don't have to give up on that dream. But two, I think it really helps with balance. Um, so having these interests outside of medicine, like, you know, like I, I said, I did the photography for the dance studios, I did martial arts and stuff. So like, say for example, I get a patient comes in and, you know, they've injured themselves and well, actually, well, here's a really good example. So some of the things, some of the things that I've encountered in my time is like violence from patients against our staff. And then I've had, um, you know, like there's this, uh, a guy who tried to attack me with a steel pole. Um, and then he goes, you know, I, I know you were saying some Kung Fu or something. And I'm like, oh, really? I, I, I did martial arts too. And then suddenly, the, just just me saying that suddenly started to diffuse things. And then we just started talking martial arts for a bit. And then he went from threatening me with a steel pole to giving me a hug and saying thank you. And, you know, <laughs> that would never have happened <laughs> you know, in any other environment, you know. Um, so it, my point is that it makes you more human when you've got these other interests, right? You're not just this doctor that is speaking down to your patient from this position of power or knowledge or whatever. You're a human that's got, you know, things that they can relate to, you know. Um, so when I was working with the dance studio, it's like, you know, 13 year old girl, girl come, comes into the emergency department and, you know, she's, you know, sprained her ankle. It's like, you know, oh, I work for Jason Common from So You Think You Can Dance. It's like, oh, well, you know, and then suddenly you know, she opens up about everything, you know, and it, it it's, it's amazing the difference in the way that patients will respond to you when they, they've got a common ground with you. Whereas being a doctor is something that's pretty foreign to most people. So, you know, you've got to find ways to bridge that gap somehow. Um, yeah, so I, think, me, yeah. I think that interaction is really nice because I feel like the doctor may make you, the doctor aspect, by making you more sensitive to the health issues in you know photography and fashion but then that fashion and and creativity also helps you connect with patients really well as well yeah absolutely and and ironically it is you know my background in in the music and the photography that allowed me to make the material that i do for you guys you know uh i recently spoke at a conference and there was you know came across a lot of people who were sort of saying that you know the, the stuff that i do is really really cool um but I've just got this really weird, unique combination of experiences that I've been through in my life that allows me to actually do that quite easily. Whereas I think for a lot of other people, it'd be quite hard to to uh, produce the sort of stuff that I'm producing. I was wondering when you were learning or when you were practicing the drums or in bands or doing photography alongside med school and being a doctor, did you view those as like separate or were they like an outlet or did they counterbalance medicine or were they just like a separate activity that you also did? Um, definitely separate, but like it was definitely, um, it, it's kind of funny, like it's still to this day, I feel weird when patients call me doctor um, because I don't see myself as just a doctor. Um, 
you know, yes, that's one of the one obviously a big part of my life and what I do. Uh, but I've never seen myself as just just a doctor. Like I, I'm I'm just John, but you know, John happens to do quite a few different things. Um, and so uh, yeah, for me it was always a, 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 a more of a balance kind of thing. And um, yeah, these are just things that I you know I've enjoyed doing and they've added to to my life experience and 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 who I am you know as a person. Yeah, and on that note, kind of the the final overall question. With all things considered, the the working night shifts, the the trek medic, the music and photography, which you you know are currently not actively participating in. If you look down the line, you know, five years, ten years, are there any? Do you see yourself in a particular place or doing particular things? Yeah, look, I've got no idea, man. <laughs> I, mean, I think it's partly because of the the way that my life has sort of flown over the years, you know, and it's always been a door just seems to open. I go through it. I just take the opportunity. I just see where it leads me um, without any expectation. So when I got into photography, it was never to become, you know, Vogue's next top photographer or anything like that. It was just a door that opened. I just wanted to see how far I could take it, you know, um, and that's kind of been the way that I've approached, you know, most things in my life. Um, so as a result, I never get terribly disappointed because I don't set myself this unrealistic goal that I, I, I fail at. Um, and I can just enjoy it. I can enjoy the journey, you know. Um, and like, you know, now what my, my hobby is to, I've, I've gotten into making lamps, you know, um, that, that, that's my, my new thing now. And I don't know how, you know, how, how much time I'm going to eventually invest into that and whether that's going to go anywhere as a big thing or a small thing or just a hobby, but yeah i mean i i do really enjoy the current balance of the doctor work with the teaching work um i find them both really fulfilling um but yeah as to whether i add on anything more on top of that um i think i'm kind of good like i'm like, yeah that, that, that keeps me pretty busy great thanks a lot for your time then john i really appreciate Sorry? it and yeah thanks again for taking the time to chat about all these different aspects no problem